The Oscars came out, what, I think on Monday. Uh, he posted a long thing about movies that you should watch, and so I kind of jot, went through some of the nominations and jotted some suggestions down because I like to watch movies. But the worst is when you want to watch a movie and then you're like, well, what do I watch? And you have no idea. So this time I, you know, and I wrote down these movies. One of them was this one called The Holdovers, and um, it's, I won't, I won't go into a lot of detail about it, but it's, you've got these two people who end up sort of cramped together in uh, boarding school over Christmas break. And the whole plot of the movie kind of revolves around this idea of um, how much do you share with another person? How vulnerable do you get? And how do you protect yourself from sharing? And why do you sort of guard yourself from sharing your true self with other people? And so it's kind of a, and, and, and it's really well done as well on, on top of everything else. So I watched that on Friday and it, just because we're dealing with vulnerability and creativity, it, uh, it struck me that this, this movie kind of deals with that theme of what does it mean to know and to be known and why do we and how do we guard ourselves from truly being known and then what happens when actually we let that guard down and share uh, parts of ourselves with other people. So if you're looking for a good movie, um, The Holdovers, it's with uh, Paul Giamatti is in it, who um, he's been in some pretty good stuff, but he's not like one of these real super well-known names, but um, but he's really good in it. So anyways, there you go. Nobody asked for it. Um, take it or leave it, but uh, it's well, it's worth watching. What was the platform to watch this? Uh, it was free on, I think on Peacock. Yeah, it's oh, free. Okay. Yeah, I so look it up. Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's it's streaming on Peacock. I think it was Peacock. I'm almost positive. Um, because I'm I'm a cheapskate, and so it's like, well, I had like three that I looked at, like, oh, this one's free. I guess I'll watch that one. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's yeah, you know. Um, okay, I'm gonna open with uh, Genesis one. We're looking today at vulnerability and creativity, and the relationship between. Uh, being able to be creative and how, what that has to do with actually being vulnerable and, and kind of how that ties in with being made in the image of God. I said this last time. What we're going to do is I'm probably going to talk a little more this time. Um, and then, But then next time is going to be almost all discussion because we're going to have Emily Stanick in here. Emily, I think you all know Emily plays flute here. And so I just kind of on a whim sent her an email and asked just about what does it mean to be vulnerable in, in being an artist and a you know, musician. And she's like, I've got pages if I can share about that. And I said, well, how about come to my class and we'll just kind of have a discussion. So next week she's going to come and I'll probably give some little questions to prime the pump. But then we'll just have class discussion on that, that theme and on that topic. So I'll kind of I'll probably be doing a little more of the talking this time, and I will do almost none of it next time. So um, Genesis 1, 27 and, um, and 28, um, um, there's much more we can get into on this, but I want to just zero in on these two verses. <clears throat> so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I suppose we could go on and, and see how that mandate expands to cover not just, you know, fish and birds and such, but everything, right? In other words, God is giving human beings not only dominion, as in you've got authority, but also a mission, which is to cultivate and to exercise that dominion over creation for the purpose of flourishing. And, um, and that, so that's what, that's what I want to unpack with us this morning. Um, but before we get too far into it, let's, um, let's pray. Let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Father, thank you again for the time that we have to study your word. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on what it means to be made in your image and how that applies to, uh, to creativity and how it applies to um, expressing your authority wherever it is that you've placed us in this world. Uh, as we move through this time this morning, we pray that your spirit would guide and direct us. Um, you be our teacher. Uh, you be the one who uh, leads us into what is true and good and right. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I thought I'd start by telling you about the time that I got the, uh, the very worst grade in the entire class. It was in the ninth grade. 
And I, it was a writing assignment, and it was we just had to write a short story, which seemed simple enough. And I got the idea to write a story that was comprised of all uh, lyrics from all the like pop songs at the time. So I, I was taking song lyrics from every song that was famous at the time, every song that was playing on the radio, and to try to take quotes from all these songs and somehow fashion them into a story. And it went about as well as you'd expect. Um, the story was terrible. In fact, uh, when I got it back, um, you know, so, it, I mean, there's no plot to it. There's no character development. There was no, I mean, it was just a jumble of, of sentences and, you know, nonsense. So I get it back and the, my ninth grade teacher, Mr. Hofstede, you know, there's red pen all over the place. It was like, you know, this ink pen had snapped in two and just bled red ink everywhere. And my final grade was 30%. So we grade on those, not A, B, C, D, and F. It was out of 100. So 30 out of 100. And, and I think that was probably being generous, right? I think he's probably scrounging up someplace to give me points. And, uh, and it was by far the worst, uh, F, uh, the worst grade in the class. Well, actually, not by far. There's one kid who got 40%. Uh, so, but it was the worst grade in the class. And, um, and one of the comments that Mr. Hofstede wrote on there, he said, whatever it is that you were trying to do here, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, was about as truthful as you could get at that time. Now, um, I'm, I'm not saying this to brag, but something like 20 years later, um, I published a book. And I felt a little bit of pride in that. And actually, if I'm being really honest, that, that remark from my my teacher came back to my mind. It's like, okay, well, actually, this time it worked. Uh, this time I managed to try something and it did work. But I tell you that story because actually, I th number one, my, my teacher was right. I mean, this was a terrible, terrible story. But it's funny that you saved it in your memory box. I did. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's there. Now, why I and and I did save it for a reason was because there's there's a little sense in which um something good happened there which was I was trying something. Right. Now, you don't get points for trying, okay? You shouldn't get points for trying. I'm not one of these everyone gets an award sort of person, but but that that was a that was a creative effort that was all about attempting something and trying something a little bit outside the box and try you know making an attempt at something creative now creativity doesn't always work right i mean there's plenty of songs that probably never get written or never really make it to prime time there's plenty of books that never get published because they're just lousy books but they're an effort they're at, they're an attempt at um at creativity and what's interesting i think and, and this is an observation i'm going to get into in a little bit, but creativity in our culture is actually, um, there's, there's a deficit of it. There's, you know, people are not really encouraged to be creative, uh, at least not past a certain age. There's, there's, and I'll say more about that in a little bit, but there's kind of a, in, in about early mid elementary, um, creative efforts drop way off. There's sort of like a cliff and I'll explain why the data suggests that in a little bit. But I, I thought maybe what it'd be fun to do, or maybe fun, maybe I'll come to regret it, but just ask how many of you would, con if, you had to ask, if you had to consider yourself, would you consider yourself a creative person? Is there anyone that would put up your hand? Don't be shy, but how many of you would say, yes, I'm a creative person? None of you. I mean, I was told it as a kid a lot, but I don't know. So how about now though? Because maybe, maybe like in my work, but not like in life. I don't know. Anybody want to be brave? Yeah. Aspects. Parts yeah. of what yeah. are yeah. creative yeah. in my work. Okay, good. A couple of you. Anyone else? Yeah, I would, I would agree. With okay. It's in my, okay. my work. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm creative. I just think out of the box. Yeah, okay, good. How many of you, um, just as sort of maybe an outlet, uh, when you're not at work, when you're just sort of leisurely spending time, how many of you do something that you would that other people would look at and say that's whether or not it's successful or not but how many of you have creative outlets where you actually do something creative with your spare time any of you okay okay yeah i mean woodwork counts you know i, I just know what it looks like 
But, but, <laughs> this is give me a picture and I can all right, I'll try it. But I don't create. Yes, you do. But that is creative though, don't you think? I mean, if you're actually yeah. putting some you're not inventing the idea, but you're actually yeah. you, still figure out how you have to still figure out how to do it and that's because somebody on YouTube told me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many so a couple of you said in your work you have to be creative. Um I think Rena and Amy said that, Melissa said that. Um Anyone else in your work, are you required, it's sort of part of your work to, to innovate something or to create something that's new or different? Any well, for 40 years I had to write, but I, that was past life, so. Okay. Past but, career. Past career, but that was a big part of what you did. I mean, you, yeah. you know, and writing is a very creative endeavor, right? I mean, it's, it, you're, you're sort of, to use the language of Genesis 1, you're exercising dominion over words and, and ideas. And I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but not really. I mean, it really is. Um, you know, it's, you know, Philip Yancey, uh, he said that, you know, he loves playing with words because it's sort of like you crack them open and play with them. And so it is very creative. Um, okay. Well, it's interesting. I, I, you know, there's sort of this hesitancy to even in here to sort of say, yes, I am creative. I'm a creative person. It's, it's one of these things, again, our culture is not overly, um, enthusiastic or robustly creative. And I'll, again, as I said, I'll, I'll get more into why that is in a minute. But um, I do want to suggest that I want to kind of start by laying out the uh, why, where does creativity come from? Why is it important? And I, it goes all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter 1, 27 and 28. Um, so Genesis 21, 27 and 28 is all about what we sometimes call the cultural mandate. Um, you have to remember that when you read the Bible, the first couple of chapters are pivotal in the sense of it, it sets the tone for the remaining, I don't know how many thousand chapters there are after Genesis 1 and 2. But Genesis 1 and 2 really define the characters and the conflict and the, the mission, you might say, of the entire Bible. And I'm, I'm putting that in the language of literature, but, but don't take that to mean that I think the Bible is fiction, okay? It's but the Bible sets up what God's purpose is in creation, or one of his purposes in creation, which is that he creates people to be image bearers so that you and I will then take the, the authority that God gives us, the authority that we have as image bearers, and then that we will bring that authority in, and bring that influence and exercise that authority wherever we go. So in, in the Bible, to bear the image of God is not just to reflect his character, but it's also to reflect his authority. In those days, what kings would do is they would put pictures, you know, not like photographs, but images of the king, and they would post those throughout their, their domain, their territory. And that was a way of, of sort of reminding the people and saying, this piece of land exists under the authority of this king. That makes sense? And so kings and rulers and whatever else they would be called back then would, would bring their image and stake their image around as a way of saying, my, my authority extends to this territory here. And so when Genesis 1 is using that language, what it's really saying is, God, not only are we created to reflect the character of God, but we are also created to reflect the authority of God and to bring that and to extend God's authority to the ends of the earth, right? That's our mission. That's God's mission and his purpose in this world. Now, part of what that includes is, I mean, to reflect the image of God. Is, you know, I think you'd agree with me. God is the ultimate artist, right? He's the ultimate creator. He's, he's the one, I mean, he, if you read throughout scripture, God inspires the use of language. He creates the beauty of creation all around us. He's architect, engineer, all those sorts of things are reflected in the intricacy and in the beauty and the goodness of creation. Does that make sense? You all kind of see where I'm going with this? So to reflect then God's image means to, I think, one of the implications is to carry out and to mirror God's creative nature wherever it is that we, wherever it is that God places us, right? In other words, we're, we're called to be creative. Now, creative doesn't necessarily just mean that you're a musician or a painter or an artist. It does include other things like language and woodworking. It, it can include even things like developing a new product for a company. It can be thinking outside the box when it comes to education. It can be all these different ways, and you probably could go on a whole lot more. It's um, 
give you an example too from Kurt Thompson. He applies it to mathematics. He says even math is an expression of creativity and writing algorithms and all those things. By the way, I was also really terrible in math. And so I got plenty of papers back with red ink from math teachers as well. But my point in all this is that God, the architect, artist, musician, and designer sends us into this world to uh, bring his creative, that, that to reflect his creative abilities wherever it is that he has, um, he's placed us. Does that, does that make sense? Um, Brene Brown, I'll give you, I wanted to, oops. <clears throat> Brene Brown, um, we've kind of, kind of, I've referred to her a couple of times. She says, creativity is a deeply important part of the human spirit. And then she goes on and she says that actually when we don't express creativity, she says this unused creativity is not benign. It turns into rage, grief, shame, and judgment. Now, just think about that for a moment. What, if she's right, then our failure or our lack of expressing creativity has this ability or has this potential of sort of just fermenting inside of us, and it turns into rage, judgment, shame, grief. And I think that's worth some thought and reflection. I, you know, maybe there's pushback on that, but I, I think actually she's actually on to something, right? In other words, if we fail, when we fail to be creative people, there's a real negative um, consequence to that. Did, did, does history show us one shining example of that in, in the failed artist from here, Austria? Who are you referring to? Um, Adolf Hitler. Hit, hit, Remember, he was... Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, good point. Hitler was an artist, right? And now not a stellar artist. He wasn't... You well, know, that was... But, <laughs> but maybe that was the problem, that's, that's, right? That's yeah, problem. yeah, yeah. So I, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I don't know. That's I think that's thought-provoking. Um, yeah. Because right, there's, there's such a contrast there in, in that, you know, expressing of beauty in art, like his paintings, again, not you know, super, they're not terrible, but, but they're just sort of like, you know, a house on a hill kind of thing. And, and then the atrocities and the ugliness of what he was responsible for. It's like, well, you, you don't get much further of a contrast than that. So yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, um, I like, I like that. That's a good thought. Um, probably worth some more reflection. I'm not enough of a expert on, you know, Hitler to know how, what, how that factored in, but it sure is a thought provoking idea. Um, Kurt Thompson, I've referred to him a couple of times. He's the Christian neurobiologist, psychiatrist. Uh, and last time we looked at what it means to be, uh, to be vulnerable in terms of his definition. He said to be vulnerable is remember to be seen, safe, soothed, and secure. It's to have your basic needs met. It's to be uh, cared for, knowing, knowing that you're going to be you know, emotionally cared for and so on. It also is to be seen for who you are. But it, it also means when he talks about being secure, he talks about the ability to go out and to try something, to take the risk of, of vulnerability, to take the risk of creativity, and then know that if it fails, you have sort of a home base to come back to, to repair such that you can then go out and take that risk again. Okay, So here's what, when he takes that idea, he says, love, being, in other words, being loved, Love is for me to be seen, soothed, safe, and secure, that I feel it literally in my chest, in my face, and I am turned loose then to create material things, whether it's the next new Yeti mug. Any of you have Yeti mugs? <laughs> the new thing is the Stanley yeah. Cup. Okay, they're right there. But now the Stanley yeah, Cup is the new thing, which I have all kinds of problems with, as you might imagine, but that's a different topic. Um, the, the next new Yeti mug or the next new algorithm of math that is so elegant that I can't even come up with it. So do you see what he's getting at there? What he's saying is we actually, in order to be creators, in order to be um, exercise the image of God by way of creativity, we need to be confident and secure in, in knowing that we are loved. Now, he would say not only loved by God, but also in, a, in relationships in which, with others in which we know that we also are loved. In other words, if a kid is going to attempt something artistic, they need to know that if they go out there and sing a solo and it bombs, they can come back to mom and dad and know that mom and dad are not going to shame them and humiliate them for what they did or, you know, how for how it went. But they're actually going to encourage them, support them, do the work of relationship repair such that, okay, next time I can try this again. Does that make sense? You, you all see kind of what that is? Any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, David. I, I think I recall reading a couple of places recently from pointing out that um, 
the willing, the ability to fail is necessary. And I think mm -hmm. we were speaking in the context of engineering. That's mm -hmm. probably all, you know, if you, you're so afraid to fail or to be seen publicly as failing, you're never going to come up with anything new. Exactly. Exactly right. And engineering, by the way, is a hugely creative field, as with like architecture and stuff, hugely creative fields. And if you don't feel like you can fail in there, I mean, you talk about the pressure that you're under, that destroys creativity, right? And so, so you kind of see the, um, well, I think my slides are a little bit out of order, but, um, well, maybe not, maybe this works. Um, you, you kind of see that relationship in which you need the security of, you know, to be vulnerable, right? Because creativity is an act, it's an expression of vulnerability. If you've ever tried to create something, you actually know that you're putting a little of yourself out there. And if you can't do that in a way where you actually have the confidence that you'll be affirmed and cared for, etc., you're not going to take that risk, right? Other comments or thoughts on this so far? Well, I just think of one of my heroes, Steve Prefontaine, who was actually a track runner yeah. in the 70s. But he quoted something saying, like, some people paint a picture, my art is running. Mm -hmm. And if you watch old, like, videos of him, like, his running is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like, it is, like, an art, the way that he ran. Yeah. Right. And something very hard to duplicate. Right. There's there's an art artistry about it. That's right. And um, another thing that I fail at, by the way, but uh, it, it, exactly right. It's, it's that you know, to take the risk, to try something, to compete. I mean, sports are actually artistic all on its own, right? I mean, any kind of sport, so yeah. Um, good, so why do people not create? You've already kind of started to get at this, right? You're already starting to, um, to, to sort of dig into this. What the data has suggested is that there's a really significant drop off in creativity about early elementary to mid-elementary age kids. In other words, when you when you have little kids at home, they're always creating, right? They're always playing little music things on the little uh, Fisher Price xylophone, or they're drawing and painting pictures at preschool, and they're finger painting, and they're doing all this creative stuff. And then when they move into middle, early and middle elementary, that drops off, and, and if you look at it um, statistically, like it's a noticeable drop. Now, there's different ways that you can measure that, and so I realize that you know everybody, you know, 50% of all people know that statistics can be manipulated, right? But uh, but in general, there's a trend here that's pretty clear and pretty observable, and the question is why. So what they've done is is they've they've done research, and this is uh, Brene Brown. This is part of what her research has uncovered. Um, there's a number of big reasons that begin to emerge as to why do people, why do kids stop creating? Number one, it's not practical. In other words, yeah, creating and painting and all that, it's nice to do, but how is that going to help you in your job? How is it going to help you make money, right? We all know the, the stereotype of the person, you know, by the time they get to college and they say, well, I want to be an artist or I want to be a musician. It's like, well... You need a plan B, right? Mm -hmm. And and okay, now that maybe there's some wisdom in, in some of that, but um, we put a lot of emphasis on practicality at the expense of creativity, right? So it's one thing to say, okay, if you want to be an artist, that's great. Let's talk about how you can do that. And it might mean that you do it part-time. It might mean that you're working a job that will pay the bills and then the other you know, artistic outlet as you're able. And But we don't typically do that. We say, look, we, we, we tend to quash those dreams. We tend, and I say we being culturally, we tend to say, look, it's not practical. It's not going to earn you enough money. You're always going to be living in my basement. So find a real job. <laughs> That's how we kind of approach it. Uh, that kind of thing. The second is comparison. So when you create something, you're actually, as I said a moment ago, you're putting yourself out on the line. You're, you're expressing a part of who you are. So my story that I wrote in ninth grade was terrible, but it was sort of an expression. It, it was it. Now the the song, you know, the story itself wasn't like revealing deep secrets of myself, but it was reflecting something of my effort at being creative. And and just because it didn't work doesn't necessarily mean that it was. You know, that's why I say the effort was good, right? There's an attempt there at being creative. There's an attempt at trying something, but of course the problem is, okay, well, you're doing it for a grade and it doesn't work out. You deserve the F, and that's all fine and good, but. What happens is kids begin to fear uh, being seen by others. They, they are afraid of being made fun of, right? So 
you know, they're afraid when they sing the solo or when they paint the picture or when they tell the story or when they act in the play, other people are going to see that and laugh at them. So what happens the next time that they want to try to create something? It's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Unless there's that safe place for them to come back to and sort of be encouraged, affirmed, and then sort of prepared to go out and try it again. But if that doesn't happen, creativity drops way off because they're afraid of what the other kids in the class, how they'll react and how they'll treat it. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. I'm going to pick up on Amy because I think this works as an example of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Pick up on Amy. I grew up in Coos Bay six years after Prefontaine. Mm -hmm. In fact, I lived out two blocks down the street from it for a while. Mm -hmm. But I realized going out for cross country, the bar was too high to yeah. ever right. succeed. It took me until I was an adult and started running distances with Melissa do that I began running, you know, more than just a few sprints here and there. Right. So because it was just the bar was too it's, high. The bar is pretty fontaine level, right? Say, yeah. My father. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. Not make exactly. I mean, that was a stupid thing. Exactly. Looking back at it, I should have just done it and enjoyed the running. Right. But there's a pressure there, right? There's an enormous, and it, even if the pressure is just from within, mm -hmm. it's there. It's very real. Um, you know, the standards. Now, there's other ways that you could you could experience that. Like, what about the kid whose parents are living through the kid, right? Whether it be in sports, whether whatever it is, and the enormous pressure. And of course, if a parent is trying to establish their own identity through their kid, it's not, it's not about the music and it's not about the theater and it's not about the sports, it's about the parent. So it's like, well, I need my kid to be successful. And so that, there's nothing that kid will ever do that will be enough. Theater it's always gonna fall be, short. Theater can be like that too. Mm -hmm. Like at my high school, I remember we did a play and there were only three female parts and like over a hundred girls tried yep. out. I'm like, I'm not, I'm like, why bother? Right. Like, I didn't even try out. Right. Exactly. But um, my friend's mom created just a small drama club in the church I went to youth group with for people who did just want to act. Right. And there was less pressure. And yeah, it was kind of like the subpar drama group, but we were still able to like cool. use our creativity. Yep. Yeah, David. Which kind of brings up, I mean, isn't there a place for average and even Maybe it's a word I shouldn't use. Even mediocre. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a genuine effort. Absolutely. Yeah. The, every, every year, this is the last youth group meeting that we do here, and when, when I'm leading it, I, I kind of talk to the, to the teens about the calling of Jesus to be average, which is not the most compelling thing that I ever say. It's not the most, but, but I really firmly believe that we are a culture that, you, you know, um, we... And social media has factored into this because what you know, social media is all about look at me. And if you want to be seen, you have to be like, you know, you have to be superstar level. And I really believe that is that is a, a whole new import into culture. I don't believe that's the biblical. I think we're called, you know, there's a sense in which some people will really stand out. But by and large, we're called to be average, ordinary followers of Jesus. I think that's so hugely important, and, and we fall into this mindset of we think that we have to be stellar at everything, and we've got to post it on YouTube, and we've got to put it on Instagram, and we've got to put it out there so everyone can see us, and it's like, don't get sucked into that. I mean, what a waste of time and energy, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, end of my tire, but you're exactly right. Um, there's nothing wrong with being mediocre. Now, I'm not saying, you know, put in a lazy effort just because, you, you know, you, you strive to do the best you can with what you have. But the fact of it is, half of all human beings are un, are below average. <laughs> Let that sink in for a minute, right? <laughs> um, last thing, Kurt Thompson says, the fear of being seen. This is this is related to the idea of the comparison mindset. But Kurt Thompson says this: I can't create these artifacts of beauty and goodness because I'm burning from creative energy, trying to contain all the parts of me that I don't want you to see. So what he's getting at there is, is because creativity is actually pulling back the curtain a little bit and letting ourselves be seen, it's not just that we compare ourselves to other people, it's that we actually don't want to, we don't want to be seen. We don't want, we, we want to guard ourselves as much as we can. We're going to, um, we're going to come back to that in a few weeks when we look at, probably two or three weeks, when we look at um, how do we handle shame? So Adam and Eve fall into sin. From, from nakedness and unashamed to they both realized that they were naked and they hid. How do we hide today? That's a huge thing. We all do it. And what Kurt Thompson is saying here is one of the reasons that we fail 
to promote creativity is because we don't want people to see us. We don't want people to see our sadness, our pain, our fear, our loneliness, our even, even the good things in us. Right? So if you write a symphony, you're actually expressing something of your, you know, your creative goodness. And there's a risk in that. We don't want people to see that. All of that, what are we actually talking about? Well, we're talking about shame, right? Because shame, we've kind of said from the very beginning, shame is about that feeling of I'm not good enough. Shame says, I, shame is that voice that says you are not enough. So you're either, it, it's not practical, which is a performance-based thing. Performance-based thinking says you need to be able to succeed and to, to perform at a certain level of being able to make income and so on. And if you can't do that, well, you're not good enough. Comparison says, when I look at person Y over there and I look at myself, she's better than me, I'm not good enough. The fear of being seen says, if I am exposed for who I am, I am sure to be judged and I'm sure to be rejected. Do you see how all that kind of factors in? Do you see then that relationship between shame and creativity and how shame hinders that? So when you think of this in the context of the cultural mandate, which we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna tie it back um, in a couple of weeks, but here's the mission that God has. Essentially, God says to human beings, I am creating you in my image to be creators, to be cultivators, and I need you to go out and do that. I want you to go out and do that. But there's this big thing that gets in the way. And, and as I said, we're going to expand on that in a couple of weeks. But I just want you to kind of see how this, how this um, works together. So do you know, um, and I said this at home. Um, no, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the, the, uh, they've kind of done yeah, some research on this too. But teachers' least favorite kids in the class, do you know who they are? It's the creative kids. Now, no teacher, no sensible teacher would ever say, I don't like creative kids. In fact, they'd probably say the opposite. They probably would tend to say, we love creativity. But the problem is that functionally, and this is not true of all teachers, all right? So I'm, I'm speaking in generalities here. But functionally, what happens, creative kids tend to get into the most trouble. Because by nature, creative kids, um, and this is, um, this is some data I find. I have a website. I forgot to um, get the name of it. But there was an article, it was called Creative Children Were the Teacher's Least Favorite. And so the article goes on and says, well, why is that? And the, the answer is that creative kids tend to be impulsive, nonconformist, determined, and individualistic. Now, those are actually a lot of ways good traits for creative kids, right? Creative kids, they're not going to think in the same mold or pattern as everybody else. They're individualistic. Now, there's, you know, okay, there's downsides to every quality and every trait, but individualistic kids kind of think they, they want to express themselves. They're not conformist, so they tend to have a harder time following rules. Now, um, you could, you know, you could go through all of history and look at any of the great artists, and you can actually find lots of evidence on this. This is, you know, it's pretty true. All of those things might be great in a creative outlet, but what happens when you put them in a more traditional classroom? They don't do very well. Right? They tend, I mean, this is like creative classrooms are about order and structure and routine. And I'm not, I'm not an educator. I'm not an educational theorist by any stretch. So I, I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't do it that way, but I'm just pointing out the fact that you get these creative kids that are super creative. They got super, they're super talented, but they might not fit into the traditional classroom. And so then they get a lot of pushback from teachers and, and um, it makes it more challenging in, in a traditional classroom. Oh, but isn't that fit in our world today? I mean, you know, as a recovering educator, uh, <laughs> we, we hi, Caleb. Uh, it's it, there's standards and there's norms, and mm -hmm. we created those standards and norms that, that say everybody needs to have an understanding of this. This is what a good, educated individual is like. Mm -hmm. So it actually squashes creativity in the sense of right. if you don't perform in these st right. set of standards, but our society does the same thing. This is, you know, how yes. to perform. This yes. is how to, you know, all that. And it does stunt the, the creativity. And, and because we are, we're aiming at a certain, a, a culturally defined goal of what the successful and good life looks like. Right. And, and maybe, you know, generally speaking, it's um, you make good money, you're in a, a, a reputable and admirable career, and you've got, you know, there's other things we could add to that. And so it's like, what is going to aim and what is going to get you to that goal? Creativity, that's why I like that first one, it's not practical. Creativity doesn't necessarily get you there. Right. And so, you know, if you, if you, it's interesting visiting like other, and I remember a few years ago when I was in Ukraine and um, 
we were, I was, the place where I was teaching was at sort of a camp or retreat center or something like that. And it, we shared with lots of other organizations that kind of come and go. There was one in there, it was a ballet, so sort of like Russian ballet. They were practicing in the room underneath where we were teaching. And I went on a break and I just went in and looked and I was like, man, these kids are dancing. Like Russian ballet it was like, wow. And and, and just observing more broadly in, in Ukrainian culture, we don't have that same level of creativity in American culture. I'm not saying that it's absent. I mean, we do have, you know, dance and we teach that. So it's, it's, it's not a question, it's not a binary of you either have it or you don't, but it's, it's more of a sliding scale. Whereas I think Western culture is lower on that because we value productivity, we value, we're more utilitarian. I think. Now, maybe I'm wrong. You want to push back on that. But, well, yeah, isn't Craig this and Jerry. because our nation pr produces far more lawyers than we do engineers? I mean, that, to that Yeah, point. right. Right. I think that's probably right. And I think there's other reasons in that, too. The amount of lawyers, by the way, has gone up since about 2000 as we become as, as sort of individual relationships. Our, our culture becomes more individualistic. So we don't work out conflict by going to our neighbor and saying, hey, listen, um, you, you did this and here's the effect it had. Can we work this out? What do we, what do, we do now? We go to our lawyer and get a cease and desist letter, right? And so, which is, but, but that's exactly right. So we, we, we are, for, for lots of reasons, and that I think can erode creativity overall. Um, Jerry? Well, um, based on Selma Kaiser graduation rates, we must be living in a creative city. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, well, right, and that's a that. There's a whole other <laughs> thing tied to that. But yeah, Salem Kyler graduation rates are not very good, um, for for lots of reasons. But yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> you'd wish it was that we had super creative people, but I'm not sure that's always the case. Um, okay. Any other any other thoughts or, or comments on that? I I. I wish you would talk about that statistic with the kids and the drop off and mm -hmm. things like that. You know, these creative kids, these ones that are outside the box, you know, now we just want to say, oh, ADHD or this problem, mm -hmm. that problem, Medicaid. You know, I, um, and, and so I, you know, my heart goes out to those families that have these kids that are high maintenance, so called high maintenance. Mm -hmm. Because they, they they could be creative leadership material, you know. Yeah, yeah. I sometimes wonder about that. You know, I'm not I'm not an expert, and I'm not you know I ADHD and all that. I'm, I have no problem medicating when necessary, but I do sometimes wonder if that's just our sort of knee jerk reaction. I, I'm not an expert, but I I do sometimes wonder what it would be like if either a uh, traditional classrooms were restructured to allow for and to promote more creativity. Again, I'm an idealist here, so I, I'm not a on the ground in the trenches sort of person on this, but I wonder what that would look like. And by the way, this also has to do with gender. Um, traditional schools are more geared towards female learners than to male learners. Um, and, and that's a real challenge. That's, you know, so that's, again, I could go off on that too, but I won't. But I do sometimes wonder, what if we, what would it look like to restructure traditional classrooms that allowed for promoted more creativity and less insistence on falling in line, sitting in your desk and memorizing and, you know, how would that improve? But also number two, maybe, maybe if that's not always possible, maybe it's, it's, you know, charter schools, you know, more charter schools that allow for the freedom and creativity that kids that maybe struggle in a more traditional classroom would do better in a setting where there is more freedom and they're encouraged because sometimes, what, again, what happens is these kids are looked at as trouble kids, and they're not. They're just super smart and creative kids, but they're in an environment that's more traditional. And so, I, again, I, I say a lot of times, more and more, that I'm great at finding problems. I'm lousy at the solution. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes know. I think it is because, I mean, I teach kids that come from, some of them from pretty tough backgrounds, like low income, poverty, all kinds of things going on. And I find like with some of our creativities, they just need a lot of assurance. Yeah. Just like, oh, it's mm -hmm. okay if you want to put six eyes on your horse. It's art, you know, it mm -hmm. looks great. Right. And they just need, one of my preschoolers, we just have a box of materials and we just have to encourage her like, what materials do you want to use today? Like, what do you, and with that teacher guidance, but like once you get to the upper grades, you can't do that as much as too many kids. Right. That's yeah, and you, you, you raise another thing, which is sometimes mm -hmm. art is taught as do it this way. Paints this piece on that part and then that piece and then look you've created something it's like no you've put something together which isn't all bad but allowing a little more freedom to just 
you know, okay, like you said, if your horse has six eyes, congratulations, Picasso, you're onto something. Right? <laughs> um, let me give you a few, these are my uh, efforts or attempts at some solution or some practical things. Um, find your creative outlet and encourage your family if applicable to do the same. And keeping in mind that creativity is not limited to um, the fine arts, music, um, theater, uh, poetry, etc. But you know, cooking can be creative, math can be creative, engineering. Um, there's lots of ways, and really look at uh, finding your own outlet. I guess again at the beginning, I said, how many of you would be considered creative? And you're like, well, maybe a little bit. But but find where you can be creative, and then sort of live into that as as best you can. Um, consider how you enjoy that which is beautiful. So sometimes creativity is just listening to like good music and appreciating it. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine turned me on to jazz music, and I just, I love jazz now. I'm not an expert. I, you know, there's a few songs that I could certainly tell you who plays them, but, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these super educated, but I just love jazz music. Um, and then that got me into like blues. And um, so just, just finding that outlet and learning to appreciate it. Um, for others of you, it's going to be, you know, you spend a lot of time hiking or, you know, finding a mixture of things. Um, finding ways to share your creativity with others, by which I mean uh, take that risk of, um, you know, sharing the painting or the poem or the writing that you did, even if it's terrible in your mind, just share it. And because that's a way of just, it, it is taking that risk of being vulnerable. And I think, you know, you obviously have to do it with people that you trust. Um, and you have, you know, sometimes it's, hey, look, I'm not looking for feedback on this. I just wanted to share this. And then you just share it. And sometimes it's like, hey, well, tell me what you think. How can I make it better? Um, consider how your creativity might point to your own fears, anxieties, and insecurities as an opportunity for healing. That's a little more sort of esoteric. But it says when you are creative, actually, you may find that it sort of reveals these like, huh, I'm afraid of what people think of me. If I share this, I'm afraid of how people are going to perceive me and how they're going to judge me. So it's like, okay, well, that's something to give some, that, that's almost, a, that is a spiritual thing. Then it, it sort of takes it to the next level. It's like, where, where, is, where is this a spiritual problem? And then, and then as we're going to see in this, we're not there yet, but we're going to see, okay, so then how does the gospel come to bear on that? How does, your, how, how does the gospel retell the story in a way that gives you security out of which you can work? How does the gospel help you be seen, safe, soothed, and secure? So that then you then go out, you have that place to be repaired, and then you go out and try again on being creative again. So, so just pay attention as the way that it kind of taps into some of those deeper things and says, huh, yeah, I didn't realize that I am somewhat insecure about this, or I'm afraid of how people are going to see me. And then you begin to ponder the question, where does the good news of Jesus bring healing in that? All right, we are out of time. Um, as I said, I did more of the talking this time, but next week Emily will be here. We'll continue. It'll be just dialogue and um, discussion. But uh, let's let's close in prayer together. Father, we thank you that you have created us in your image and you've created us to be uh, creative. You, you've made us to reflect your beauty, your ingenuity, your creativity, wherever we are in, um, in creation. Uh, we, we confess it's not always easy to do that for some of the reasons we've hit upon. We're afraid of how people will see us and what they'll think of us. But uh, you remind us that the, the true measure of worth is not what others think of us or even what we think of ourselves, but ultimately is how do you see us? What do you think of us? And so help us to be always grounded in that such that we then are more and more willing to take that risk of being vulnerable in the ways that you've created us to be. Watch over us, be with us in the rest of our day as we gather together to worship you. We pray that what we do and say today will all be to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I share something real quick? Please, yeah. We're talking about all this.